Caroline? Okay, um, just a few housekeeping things. I think it's the group remains well behaved in this small and we can just do this self muting and um, I am okay with people um, interrupting to ask questions. Uh, if, if you prefer, you could type a question into the chat and I'll encourage Kim to interrupt me and stop me. I'll try and pause and just make sure that um, there's plenty of time for questions. But the goal that I set today was <clears throat> we have done a series of webinars uh, before that are pre-recorded and available on a YouTube channel. But this one, I thought I'd cover all the main stuff, but try and do it a little bit faster and focus in on what I am aware of, at least from talking to a few folks or some of the um, processes you want to learn more about in terms of data entry and batch data entry and also um, understanding the data sources. So that was going to be the approach. I'm not going to spend a whole time on roles and privileges, um, but let me just get started with the the screen here you can see just as a reminder that um, FTEM is accessible through IFTDIS, so one must first have an IFTDIS account that is uh, current and active before they can request an FTEM account. The IFTDIS landing page actually has a little FTEM information. Um, and then once you sign into IFTDIS, um, if you've already got an account, you'll just have FTEM across your navigation bar and can click it. Uh, if you haven't yet uh, got an account, that's where you would click on it to request your account. Um, so once you get into FTEM, we do have a a, um, a set of roles and privileges. Um, that those of you that have accounts are probably aware of. The main thing to know is that there's um, three real levels. There's a, a agency administrator who is doing account approvals for your geographic region. I believe that's that's Dana. Skelly um, and maybe some other folks, certainly other folks for the BLM. Um, and then those that will enter data will have what's called an editor role. I can show you um, administrators can access a user list. And then there's a viewer, which is just people that don't need to enter data but would like to look at the data. Um, so for example, if I go to um, all and then forest service and um, Pacific Northwest, I'll get a list of the users um, within that area. Um, so if you get into any um, issues or questions with roles and privileges and account access, I would start um, first with your regional contact and then with uh, a help desk ticket if you can't resolve it by just corresponding with your, your local regional um, administrator. And just to point out too that, that this is by agency, but we do allow for multi-agency, for example, with the service first approach in Oregon. So you can be an editor for both the BLM and the Forest Service. Um, with that, just a few things on the home page here to point out, I think our um, there's contact info for agency leads if there's questions that have to do with um, policy or account issues, et cetera. There's um, agency-specific policies and guidance linked here. They're all current. Uh, we do have a really nice help section that I think is underutilized, so I would encourage people to go here first. There's some technical documentation. There's information how to access an account, FAQs specific to FTEM, so quite a good bit of information there. Um, and if all else falls, you, you can still submit a help desk ticket. Um, we do have a bunch of uh, pre-recorded webinars, as I said, on the YouTube F10 playlist um, that are available here on the right. Um, and then the uh, the main pages here, FTM monitoring and FTM reports. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on reports because they're pretty simple and I think self-explanatory once someone goes in there. Um, so we'll spend the bulk of our time in FTM monitoring. Before I go on, I guess I'll pause and see if any questions have come in so far. Nope, you're good so far, Carolyn. Okay, cool, thanks. Um, so once you select FTEM monitoring, um, you're going to get auto-zoomed into an area that you've identified as your preferred uh, map extent, and you'll also be 
um, in as a representative of the agency you request an account for, um, or if you have multiple agencies, uh, privileges, you'll have an actual toggle pick list like I have here in the upper right. Um, I am, am a FTEM administrator, so I can toggle between um, all agencies. Some folks will have Forest Service and BLM, but many will just have Forest Service or BLM, whomever you work for. Um, I have my map extent preference set at the CONUS, but if you had it set for Oregon, you would automatically be zoomed into Oregon. So you most of you that have been in here have probably already figured out um, that this, this pre-populated layer list with its color code um, symbology is actually intended to, to sort of provide a first glance status of FTEM monitoring for your agency. So the symbology represents the red are fires um, that should be checked for potential interactions between wildfires and treatments. The yellow or orange means that there's monitoring in progress and the green means that the monitoring is completed. So if it's gray, that means that there was uh, no interaction detected. And we have two groups here, one for points and one for polygons. Um, and that's just because of the nature of the way uh, the data comes in. We have these two different groups. And similarly, uh, the treatments come in as both points and polygons. Um, so the symbols are these squarey things for um, polygons and the dots for points. And again, broken into, um, this is agency in this case, I'm logged in as Forest Service, so it's just showing Forest Service points and polys. So that's just a quick overview of this comes pre-populated. Um, you can turn these on and off if you find it um, a little bit busy, um, but that's sort of what this display intends. So right away, you can look at any red and know that if you work for the Forest Service, and I zoom into Oregon, um, uh, anything showing up as red needs to be checked. And there's either monitoring to be completed, um, or you need to verify that there, there, um, the detections suspected are actually not detections. So here we've got a variety of green, yellow, and red. Um, so this first tab that we're on, this is a four tab process. You're defaulting to this first tab, which is at the wildfire level. So each thing listed here is a fire. Um, then you've got some information about the fire, most importantly being the, the um, probably the number of interactions. Right now it's auto sorting um, to the highest number of interactions at the top, just to make sure that um, folks know, um, you know, their workload. And then you can toggle through this list and it'll just have a decreasing number of interactions. You can change the sort just by clicking on either one of these. Um, there's a few other functions available here that might be of interest. One is that you can go into a, either the split screen mode, which we've defaulted to, or a full map mode, or a full um, Hey, I'm gonna go tabular mode. Yeah, the chowder thing. Oh, they open that? Yeah, they open it. <laughs> hey guys, mute Hello. your phone, please. We can hear you. I'm good. I don't need a burrito. Thanks, though. <laughs> uh, while we're paused, does anybody have any questions um, so far with what I showed on that initial map page? Okay. So no, no questions uh, so far, Caroline. You're good. All good. All right. Thanks, Kim. Um, so. Other thing to note is this: these symbols and this list in the table, um, they match the color coding and the actual symbology of this layer list. So the ones displayed as flames are fires represented as points. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a point one acre fire. That's mean that, that the wildfire is only represented by a point. Like here's the Russell fire of 12 acres, but it's represented by a point. Um, and these uh, are polygons. So there's a few things you can do from this screen. Um, if you select a fire, it'll open up a little drop-down panel. Um, probably one of the most uh, first things to do is just zoom to the fire, and it'll automatically bring you in. So the significance of the points and the polygons is is um, important in terms of the system's auto detection of potential interactions. If it um, if a fire is represented by a point then the 
potential interactions are detected using a buffering technique. Um, and there's a formula in the help content for that. And it will be represented by a um, turquoise circle around the um, fire. I'm kind of, oh, this is a really tiny fire. Let me pick a bigger one. So this one, if I zoom way in, it just has a little teeny tiny um, aqua circle around it because it's only 0.1 acres. Let me pick um, that 12 acre fire and maybe get a better look at it. So the way that buffer is used is that it will, um, here's a 26 acre one. It will uh, put out the buffer and look for a list of treatments that fall within that buffer as potentially interacting with that fire. There you can see the, the aqua buffer. So that's a first approximation. Um, and that's where the local knowledge of sort of vetting that list, we think of it as a shopping cart where you can add or remove treatments. Um, so that's the case for a point wildfire. Here you can see the aqua circle and which treatments it's picking up on. Um, if you have a polygon wildfire, um, piece of data representing a, uh, the actual polygon, then um, it will do a, a true um, polygon interaction with the treatment data. So let me zoom out to find one. So here's this um, box car fire that has 14 potential interactions. If I click on that and zoom to it, we'll get the actual um, in aqua, the, the fire perimeter. And uh, underneath that, we'll be able to see the treatments um, hey, potentially Carolyn? interacted with it. Yep. Real, real quick, while we're um, we got a quick question here from Robin um, about Paul. I, I'm just going to ask it so everybody can hear the answer. But she's got a question about um, have we been loading polygons for fires that have been contained but not controlled? Um, for example, is a fire, I guess, called the Delta Fire uh, that folks have been waiting to enter data on, but has not been loaded yet. OK, yeah, let me talk a little bit about the data sources. And then uh, we also have Andrew Bailey, who's the expert who built this integrated database to, to get more in the weeds. But I'll give you the layman's um, term, and Andrew can correct me. So the, the wildfire um, polygons come from GeoMac. Uh, and the wildfire points come from Irwin, um, but there's several different uh, data sources that can feed into Irwin. Um, there's a nightly pull um, to get updated perimeters from GeoMac, but we're limited to the um, what's listed in GeoMac and, and the contained, controlled, or out. That those have to be. Um, one of those three has to be declared by policy before it's going to be active in FTEM and auto-detecting interactions. Uh, that's the original policy was more as a reporting tool, so no reporting was to be done on a fire until it was declared, contained, controlled, or out. So it'll show up as a polygon, but the polygon may be gray and not necessarily having any interactions auto-detected yet. And now that I've started so Robin, that, maybe I'll just turn it over to Andrew. Well, Rob, and Robin's question involves a fire that's been called contained, but not controlled. Yeah, and what what they're not going to, I don't know if they've called it controlled yet, but some weeks back, this is Robin, some weeks back, mm -hmm. um, they weren't going to call it until there was a shift in weather, but the fire was just doing stuff internally. And people have been waiting to enter data, and the polygon's not loaded, and they can't. But it may have changed at this point, but a couple weeks ago, it was not in there. And I look at, of course, it's probably in there. Uh, is that it? I've got Delta up on my screen now. Shasta. Shasta. Is that on the uh, shy? So uh, we can open up this full panel and see in the right. Yes, that's the California Shasta Forest. Yeah, so it had been date of October 9th. Yeah, so it had been okay uh, contained for a very long time, like weeks after it started. So, 
but it was not called control until recently and they wanted to enter data and it wasn't loaded because it was only contained. Right, it, it actually has only been contained since October, um, well, this is October 9th. Um, Erwin's Are telling me it's October 8th. It's actually still not showing a control date at all. I think it, when the uh, weather flies, uh, when it like snows on it, that, that's when they'll do it. But so that's some of the problems that we've been running into entering data, like the Mendocino complex that had blown through the Mendocino, um, had blown through the Mendocino and the area that they wanted to start entering data on, but because it was still actively burning on the north flank, they it wasn't loaded. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're, you know, what we've got here is a with with new data sources, we have some some options for maybe tweaking some of the business rules. Um, but when the business rules were originally stood up, you know, FTEM wasn't fuel treatment effectiveness monitoring wasn't really done until well after the the fire was out and so the rule was that you had to report on it by a certain number of days after the fires contained or controlled actually controlled i think was the the keyword controlled or out at the time now that we're actually getting data in uh it's not real time but it's within a couple of days of of real time i think there's a lot of potential and so now our policy actually needs to kind of catch up with our um with what the data makes possible. Um, but right now, anyway, the, the direction has been in terms of policy that we don't make it available for reporting until um, until it's contained controller out. And so that one um, did report containment on October 8th. I can't say for sure at what point we made it available for reporting in FTEM. It, it might have occurred right then uh, or the very next day. Um, it might have taken a little while to, to flow through. It should have been um, the next day, but uh, that's something that we need to that we need to bring back to the steering committee for FTEM to continue to tweak those business rules. If uh, if there are really legitimate reasons, and it sounds like in some of these cases, yeah, the the, the divisions or the parts of the fire that you want to report on have been out, um, have been you know cold and, and ready for reporting for a while, while the fire itself can continues to be uncontained because of, you know, burning in other parts of the fire. So I think that's a really good point that you bring up, Robin. Thank you. Yeah, we've heard that several times now. Um, and I think uh, the steering committee has heard it as, as well. It's just a matter of um, going through the process of deciding what changes to make and, and updating the policy. And then we can adjust these filtering rules uh, on the data sets accordingly um, for the change. But right now, yes, everything is, is fairly um, delayed um, due to the various systems and rule sets. Now would be a good time, at least for the wildfire data, if, if anyone had any other questions to take advantage of. Andrew, let's not talk about treatment data quite yet. That'll be next. But any other questions on the um, wildfire data? or what you're seeing in this welfare tab, I guess I should say. If if no one has questions, I'll just kind of lay out that uh, the point data and most of the fire, uh, the fire information such as contain controlled and out dates comes from Irwin, um, which is which connects together, knits together um, our computer-aided dispatching system, so Wildcad primarily, um, and uh, the ICS or SIT-209 application, um, the WIFDIS application, fire code. So there's a number of different places that uh, that Irwin pulls data from. Um, the, the, I guess, notable thing, um, it hasn't been brought up yet, but it's worth noting that fire code or fire stat, um, your Forest Service fire reporting system reads from Irwin, but doesn't um, close the loop and pass data back in. So um, I wouldn't spend a whole lot of time comparing fire stat and what's in FTEM and wondering why what you're seeing in fire stat doesn't show up in FTEM. It's because that's a, right now a one-way path from, uh, from Irwin to fire stat, not the other way around. 
um, with me on for BLM users. Um, with me is not tied in with Irwin at all, so there there's no connection there. Um, this is uh, kind of the the best available data. Um, we've run into a few situations where fires completely somehow missed Irwin. Um, it's not common, but uh, we, we do respond to those and try to figure out why they didn't uh, why they didn't get in entered into a CAD system or into fire code or somewhere else in a way that they made it to Irwin. But uh, for the most part, um, in Region Six, you're you're sitting in places that have CAD systems and people tend to keep contain control and outdates up to date in their CAD systems. And so we're seeing those populate all the way through to FDEM. And then Caroline hit the fire polygon data. All of that comes from GeoMAC. And GeoMAC itself is a um, aggregation of data that comes from either WIFTUS or from uh, the GIS services that your GIS specialists use on, on fires. Um, and uh, also fire perimeters that were that are uploaded to uh, ftp.nfc.gov. Um, so again, best available and uh, kind of working towards some longer term solutions that will integrate final fire perimeters into the system. Hey guys, this is Dana. I'm just gonna weigh in for a second because um, we're getting to, it's like 820 something. So this is good, but I think for the purposes of why we asked for the call, getting into the batch data entry is pretty critical. Um, and maybe if there's time for these other questions, let's put that towards the end. But let's focus on the on on where Caroline was going on the trajectory towards the batch data entry discussion and then leave other stuff for the end of the call or if we need to do a follow-up. Is that okay? Yeah, copy that, Dana. Sure. I'll hush back to Caroline. Yeah, yeah no, and <clears throat> And then it's all good information with the brave new world we're in. Um, but I know Caroline can't stay on after nine. So thanks. Okay. And um, just two quick things to point out here. If uh, you don't have a polygon for your fire, you can upload a shape file here using this orange widget. There's help content on how to do that. Um, oftentimes you can pull the most current fire perimeter off of the FTP sites. Um, various sources or you may have it locally to overlay to help you look at the treatments um, and also in this add layers this green widget there's a suite of reference data um, and carefully tucked away at the bottom under um, other there is an active uh, fire perimeters geomax so these will be for viewing only but you can also see some other fires that may not be in there uh, and while I'm here also to show there's additional layers for FTEM treatment points and polys for each agency. So if you're a forest service person, but you want to look at BLM, you can turn this on and off and it won't be used, um, you know, to auto detect any treatments. It's just for viewing purposes as a reference. So that may be helpful to orient you on the landscape. So from the wildfire tab, once you've selected your um, wildfire of interest, um, let's take, um, the box car as an example that has the 14 interactions. You pick your wildfire, you can zoom to it. Um, then you wanna to proceed to treatments and you can either select the treatment button or click the treatment tab, same result, either way. Um, in this case, there was a polygon, so we're getting that represented. And here is the list of the 14 treatments that um, the system auto detected as potential interactions. And, and as I mentioned earlier, we referred to this treatments list Think of it more as your shopping cart where a local person or whoever's doing the data entry can verify um, this list and either add or remove treatments as appropriate. Again, like the, uh, the fire, you can go to a full screen mode. And when you do that, if you hover over each treatment, the right-hand panel populates with a, a little bit of additional attribute information with a fax ID for Forest Service, the SUID. Um, some additional things like that. So that may be useful for you to hone in on what the difference between these treatments are. In this case, these are all points. Um, so these um, came in as points for whatever reason. Uh, if you hit select all, that's one way to just quickly view them on the map. So in this case, uh, the symbology will give you this red X to show the treatment location. And since I'm only seeing 
what looks to be uh, potentially like one red X. It looks like these were all potentially listed under the same point um, in, this, this would be facts. So you can click on that and you're gonna get information. If I click on the, the fire and you'll get a little bit of in information about the fire. You can also um, use the identify tool within the map to drill down and get a little bit of additional information. Um, in this case, you get the information about uh, some of the treatments um, as well as about the fire. Um, so in this case, it looks like there's a whole bunch of treatments under there. Um, this is one way to look at it, is to scroll through this list. Another way that might be easier is, if I just turn off this polygon for a second, I think, when I click on this, um, I thought it was gonna pop up. But you can do it one at a time. You can turn the, um, if I select all or deselect all, and then do it one at a time, you can verify that it's each one of these showing up. So. This is where you can add or remove these treatments. If this is a duplicate, um, I see there's a lot of the same dates in here. Say you select these two and you want to remove those treatments because they're duplicates, um, you would just say remove treatments. I'm not going to do it because I'm in the production environment, but you get a verification message. Do you want to remove these treatments? If you say yes, that will remove them from the list. Um, they don't go away. It's not like you've deleted those treatments. In fact, you could add them back. There's this add treatments functionality. So this is where if you see a treatment on the map um, that it did interact with, that for some reason it wasn't picked up on, you can add it and you can specify a buffer here to go looking for additional um, treatments. And here's a whole bunch of treatments that were not auto detected, but you could check on these and add them to your list. Um, if you thought that they should be there. You can also add treatments by selecting them uh, on the map and saying add treatment. I could click up here in theory and say add treatment on one of these over here. So that's how you go through the process of determining which treatments um, you're actually going to do monitoring on, meaning enter FTDM monitoring data for. So sometimes these lists can be um, significantly longer than what truly interacted. Um, the other thing is when you are on the same footprint, there's policy rules uh, about picking which treatment to uh, represent that interaction. You don't take all of them. You take the one currently for the Forest Service, it's the one that's the most recent for DOI. It's the one that had the most impact on the wildfire. So um, that's the treatment list in a nutshell, once you've determined which treatments you want to monitor, um, you proceed to this next tab. Um, in this case, I'll just select a couple. Um, and you proceed to the monitoring tab. You can either hit the third tab or click monitor treatments. I'll bring a few over actually. So say monitor. So all the treatments that I selected came across to the monitoring tab. Um, and you can still go back and get more. You can select a couple to bring over at a time and toggle back and forth and add more as you like. And that may be of interest um, as you do what Dana referred to as the batch monitoring. Um, so if you have treatments where you know the answers are gonna be similar, you could bring them over to the monitoring tab together and that might make your job a little easier to uh, lump them that way. Once you're within uh, the monitoring tab, you click on enter data and it's gonna open up a pop-up with all the data entry fields. Um, you'll notice that I selected both um, treatments when I proceeded to monitor. So they're listed up here. You can open and close this if you bring a big list and you're doing batch monitoring using this little triangle. Um, so I've got these two treatments that I'm gonna pretend that uh, have similar answers. So Everything that has the red asterisk is a required monitoring field. Um, so the only one here that is not a required field in this first drop down is the, the time. Um, and the ones that are white are available for batch entry. So the interaction details, um, the three primary questions for FTM monitoring and or the comment field. So the, um, the one field that is not currently available for batch is, is the treatment acres burned by wildfires. This has to be uh, populated individually for each treatment. It will be auto-calculated if there's a polygon available for the 
treatment as well as a polygon available for the wildfire. Um, this number will be populated for you, but in cases where there's a point piece of data involved, it's a manual field. So the point being, you can batch enter all the required fields except these acres burned by wildfire, but you're still going to have to manually um, populate that one field individually. So it could still be a time saver, but there will still be a process of manually entering that. I didn't point out, you've also got the date here that can be batch entered. So how you guys aggregate your data for data entry, knowing this might help you how you do it, uh, how you organize them and bring them over to the monitoring tab. As you scroll down, a series of optional questions are available. Each one of these has a panel that opens up. These are all available for batch uh, monitoring as well. So if it's the case that that say the treatment allowed direct attack on all the treatments you've got selected, et cetera, the fire spread inside and outside the unit. I noticed on some sample data that was sent to me from the groups collecting data in Oregon that you guys are recording this type of spread inside and outside the unit and the, um, the flame lengths in, inside and outside the unit. So if you sort that somehow um, in a database or in Excel, that might assist a little bit with the batch entry. Um, and then all the additional, you know, optional questions are down below. Same same thing. Again, these are all optional. And then once you've finished, you just hit save or save and close. Or in this case, I'll say close and discard changes. So let me pause there and see what additional information you guys might want about the batch data entry. So, um, so Caroline, just for clarification for folks, um, you know, if, if you look at like, say, Taylor, uh, you know, one of the things we were talking about last night uh, that might help people is just to clarify that even if the polygon isn't showing up yet in the fire, if the points are showing up and those treatment interactions are showing in red, we can go ahead and start doing the monitoring on those, even though it's under a point data at this point. And when the polygon comes in, those will those will carry over into the polygon is completed. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Thanks for bringing that up. So, yeah, I switched back to the, um, the Taylor Creek fire, which has this for the Forest Service 515 potential interactions. And because it's red, um, that means that it is available um, for data entry and these, these potential interactions have been detected. So even if a polygon um, comes in later, you don't need to wait for that to do your data entry, I guess is, is my point. The, the um, spatial fire information, whether it's the buffer or the, um, the buffer used for the auto-detected interactions or the polygon use, it still needs uh, verification by the person in the editor role doing the data entry and that it will not um, overwrite your treatment list um, when that perimeter does come in. So you can go ahead and look at um, the list that it presents. I actually, I looked at this one this morning because it's interesting because the buffer in this mm -hmm. case, um, it looks like it kind of um, does not very well represent the fire spread. I actually, I did upload this one. I can just display it real quick, I think. Grab this file. Um, So this is how you go through that process. You can upload a zip file. In this case, I downloaded it from the FTP site and you add it to the map and it'll show up in your layer list. Um, and this is temporary. That won't re remain in your layer list outside of this login session. But so now we have this more useful um, representation, which ideally should help you pretty quickly do the shopping cart deal. Um, and obviously it's pretty different from the auto um, the detected aqua buffer, the fire is smaller um, than what's represented by that. So if you're confident in this perimeter, you could begin just methodically going through um, and removing all of these uh, treatment potential interactions, the red ones that fall outside of that, that polygon representation. You zoom into a couple and you can remove them 
in two ways. Like I showed, you can remove them either from um, the list on the right, the tabular list, or you can remove them using the map interface. If I haven't mentioned it, uh, move really slowly on the map and the application will be happier. There's a lot of data being processed and ingested and rendered and displayed. So sometimes it it can lock up or freak out if you're moving too fast with your clicking operation. Um, so in this case, I'm going to go to the list of treatments for Taylor. Um, we've got it here a bunch of points, a bunch of polygons under the fire. So let's say that um, I just want to remove some of these treatments down here. I should be able to um, click on that treatment. And remove it. Give the system a second. Zoom in a little further. Uh, we can see that there's points and polys together there. Impatiently waiting. Okay, there we go. So when I click on this point, I get a little bit of information about that treatment now. It's telling me. This is treatment one of three, and there's a toggle. Um, I got the treatment name. So I can uh, toggle between these three treatments here, slate to ARRA, slate to ARRA. It's got a little bit of a completion date information. And I could just say remove interaction right here, and it would remove it from the list. So you, you could methodically go through, just click remove, click remove if these are um, inaccurate. Or the other way you can do it is, is to select them from your list and they'll turn into the, the black hash marks. You can also, um, whoops, if I have one, you should be able to zoom to an individual treatment. If you double click on a treatment in this list, it'll zoom you to it. So in this case, here is this treatment. If you want to verify the location, and then since it's selected, you could say, say remove treatment there. So that's that um, shopping cart process I was talking about. and. So to circle back to your question, yes, even though there's only a point representing Taylor Creek, you could go through and do that process um, this way, and it shouldn't um, be impacted when that uh, perimeter comes in. Any questions about that? Oh, we have some other questions, but I think that one made sense to all of us in this room at least. So kind of in that, uh, in the vein of looking over treatments and is there any way on that treatment ID on the, you know, to actually sort through treatment ID like numerically and have it sorted uh, through the top of the list? Because I mean, that's really, when we're looking at our data, probably going to be the, the easiest link between the field collected data and what's showing up for treatments in there is to really, is to look at the fax ID number. And so we were just wondering if there's any way to sort that list. Well, you can sort here from this column heading. Um, yeah. I don't know if that's yeah. the kind of sort you want. Um, and also, when you're in the full screen mode here with the tabular view of treatments, there are some additional filters, if these are useful, that differentiate um, mechanical treatments from fire treatments. Um, so you can toggle these on and off, uh, you know, prep. So these are filters that you can apply when you're in this full screen table mode. Um, and also, again, remember these right-hand panel has additional attribute info that may be useful. Um, these, again, are sortable from this table. There's something to keep in mind with these filters is that it's listed here, like list filtered by agency treatment type mechanical. When you go back to the map view, um, that filter is retained. So sometimes you may have a filter set that you forgot about and you, you can turn it off here using this X and it'll unfilter so you may or may not find those filters useful um, as you try and sort the treatments um, and look for them that way I don't know how helpful that is but actually I'd say that's really helpful that's that's the type of way we'd be looking to figure out which ones are which so that that's very helpful to us so, okay, so Carolyn, just a question so when we look at that, when we're in treatments, we can sort by treatment ID, but then when we actually go to monitor and put the stuff in, then that, then it's not sorted and we don't, 
we don't have the option to do that to do that under the monitoring tab, right? So that because that's where that's we'll actually be correct. That's where we would actually need oh. it to be, so that when we go to actually put it in, you know, we could follow by our spreadsheet and by that number. So I mean, we can we can do a check here on the treatments tab, um, but you know, for us the monitor. The monitoring tab when we actually go to put it in be you know it's like a one-to-one -one relationship with your with your spreadsheet then to go you know to just check them off as you go is there a way to do that okay, that's, um if i'm tracking you the only thing that might be useful is is that whatever you select um here so however you have it sorted or however you do your check boxes only those treatments come across to monitor at a time um, and this isn't the add and remove this is just I'm entering data now so you could like I was saying in the batch find the three that are alike to go batch monitor um, do your monitoring and then go back to treatments um, you know and find the next three that are alike um, but the only way to sort here you can't really sort them other than by these these column headers are by those filters I showed you. You can't actually control this order any further than that, I don't think. So Caroline, since we're going to be doing some pretty robust testing of the system, when we find things like this that are recommendations for you guys to consider improving on, um, you want us, how do you want us to feed that back to you? That is a great question. Um, Kim, do you want to answer that one? Or Josh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, well, I guess it's going to depend on how, if, if you think this is going to happen kind of over time and it's going to come from a, a number of different people and places, I might suggest for now um, uh, compiling like a, you know, a, a document of some kind or a spreadsheet or something. If, the, if you think there's going to be, like I said, from multiple sources, multiple places, I don't know if you guys set up a Google Doc that everybody can access and put their stuff in maybe. You know, we do have the, um, the user forum within the system, but um, that, like I said, depending on how much volume you think there might be, that might not be the most efficient way. Um, we we would probably end up wanting to put some of these things in that eventually, because we want other people to see what other people are recommending. That way we can comment on it and it's, it's transparent to the rest of the user community. Um, so, so, I guess if you think there's going to be a, quite a number of things, then I would recommend a spreadsheet or a, a document that you can send to us. If there only ends so we'll, up being one or two or three or four things, then we could use the forum. So we'll start. Um, so we'll, we, we've we got a PNW. Well, you've all got the calendar invite from it. So we've got a FireNet account set up for, for this project because it seems like it's going to happen every year. We'll start a, a document that we'll share with you guys in Google Drive and then depending on how that goes, because we'll have a few people doing data entry over the next two months, most likely, um, in conjunction with the, getting the summary reports written and all that. So um, so we'll just get that going as a Google Doc, share it with you guys, and then once we've got it finalized, we'll see how you want to, if you want it to just go in the form or where you want it to go. Okay. I think that'd be great. That way we can see what kind of feedback we're getting, and if some of it's appropriate for the forum, then maybe we'll have you guys help us enter it into that and mostly because if it's it, 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 we'd rather have other names and people in the forum it kind of shows other users that you know people are using it and just helps get the word out so we can address that later but yeah i would gather it in a google doc and then we'll we'll go from there thank you so we did have another question on kind of the batch entry just to kind of another clarifying question once you're in the batch entry mode and monitoring. Um, so let's say you have five treatments and the questions are number, you know, number one is all the same and number three is the same, but maybe the, you know, the answer to number two is different. So can we go and do the batch entry for part of those answers and then come back and then do, you know, like question two on each of those or something, or, or does that work that way? Can it kind of say yes, when we put in, go back? Yeah, I should test that on QA, um, but I'm pretty sure you, you well, I, I'm sure you can do it. You just may get a message um, that says, hey, somebody has already entered data on this. Um, do you want to overwrite it? Um, so 
you would have to verify yes i know somebody already populated the answer is no but i am changing that answer to yes but yeah you can change the answers anytime you'll just get a yellow um like warning you're editing an existing record which is fine until you hit the complete um you go to the completion tab and actually uh submit this wildfire as complete um that's what editors do they're going back and forth between treatments and monitoring so that might be a smart way to approach it is to um you know just to make note of all the ones you have to go back and change one thing to that might be a faster approach okay but just to clarify like if you have a batch entry of five or six you need to fill out every one that's got a red star by it in order to save it or can you just do the ones you want I'm not sure I quite am tracking. Um, so you have. So, so kind of, you know, there's say questions one, two, and three, and yeah. you have 200 polygons in that fire that you evaluated, <clears throat> and um, 80 of them are yes on question one, um, and 60 of them are yes on question two. It'd be nice if you could enter yes on both of them or on both those questions but then come back and edit the 20 that are different as a separate batch but at least you've got the first two answers the same you know what i mean so yes. like where you have overlap get a batch done and then and then keep narrowing down the remaining overlap they should you should be able to do that um I might test it with with just like three treatments first, but I'm I'm 99% sure that 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 is fine. You'll just get that red or yellow notification that you're overriding existing data, which is fine. Um, oh yeah, you should be able to do that. Sweet, and it sounds like again, since since we're we're trying some different things here, um, maybe as we go, we'll capture any cool tricks we come up with like that, so that you guys can turn them into a training or aid or something later. Sure. The one thing I would be um, cautious about, I'm just anticipating might occur with this group. If you have multiple people um, monitoring the same wildfire or treatment, um, you could be in there at the same time. Um, and I think it's fine if you're in the same wildfire at the same time, but if you're in the same actual treatment at the same time i'm not sure what happens so if multiple people are doing batch manipulation um that could be like crossing ghostbuster rays i'm not really sure what would happen it might be better um to sort of um coordinate amongst yourselves as to who's in there you will get these yellow warnings hey you're about to overwrite data and i guess i should show you um the uh I'm not sure if everybody has, but there's audit logs where you can see every um, bit of action that's been taken on a fire. Uh, just pick this Taylor Creek. Um, I'm not sure if this is this may be only eligible to administrators, but I think editors may get this. I'm not positive. Um, you guys would have to tell me. But when you open the audit log for a fire, um, here it's saying like treatment interaction added, you know, there's 782 of these. And uh, when it says username, in this case, it says FTEM to represent that the system auto detected these interactions. I'm gonna give the fax ID number, the treatment name, et cetera. So if say Dana goes in and adds a treatment and Glenn goes in and removes the treatment, um, that will all be reflected in this audit log um, with the username um, and what actions they took. And this, this is a massive um, uh, table that can be downloaded as a spreadsheet. So there is a way to to track different users' activities, which may come in handy for you guys. Um, and then similarly, I, you guys have probably seen the, um, the tabular summaries, right, for the fires um, once the monitoring is done, um, how to look at the table summary. Should I show that? Yeah, that would be good. And it looks like we're just checking now, but Jessica and I can see what you are seeing with the audit log, which is good. You can? But, uh, okay. Yeah, so it, at the administrator level, we can. So. Okay. 
can't, which is fine. Yeah. So, for example, here's a completed fire, uh, the TP fire. If I hit table summary um, from that wildfire page, you'll get a list of um, everything, all the answers to all the questions. The gray is the fixed data, and then the blue is the questions. Um, as people responded to them. And you can download this as a spreadsheet. And if you scroll all the way over, um, you scroll this thing, it'll scroll all the way over to the right. Um, there it is. You can see, um, in this case, Jeff Crawford was the person um, doing the editing. So you, you can have a little bit of tracking on these and what responses they put for each one. So that's the table summary available on the wildfire page. Um, and just real quick, let me talk about uh, completion, like you staying on this TP fire. Um, this has a monitoring status of completed, right? The yellow is in progress. Uh, so completion, even after you've answered all the required questions for each treatment and the individual treatments have turned green, um, the fire is not truly complete until it's submitted um, from the final tab, this completion tab. Um, this one's already be, been completed. If it's two agencies, you'll submit separately for each agency. So one agency isn't waiting for another to finish their monitoring. Um, it'll give you a record of how many treatments have been monitored. In this case, if, if uh, Jeff were to get new information about the TP fire, say somebody sent him um, some maps or a PDF he wanted to attach, you could click amend wildfire and go in um, and add an attachment or, or change a response, whatever you wanted to do. And then he, he would just submit complete again. And the significance of completion is that when you do go to the reports function and start querying reports by state, agency, forest, region, et cetera, or you can't do it by forest, but by region, um, it's only summarizing fires that are in a completed status. So. Um, if it's not submitted as complete, it won't show up as completed in the report. Hey, Caroline, just for uh, clarification, just looking at that table summary, it looks like like the rest of us here, we don't actually have that uh, that information available to us. Those, those keys are grayed out. Uh, they should be available to you. Um, you're looking at a fire that had data entered. It would only it wouldn't be there for red fires. It would be there for Yellow or green ones? in the help somewhere that lists each role and privileges and what you can do, but I'm pretty sure table summary is available to all editors. Yeah, I'll make sense. You, you guys are aware of the attachments as well, right? That you can attach files, um, PDF documents, JPEGs, PNGs, um, and then download attachments. Um, yeah. And we did get, um, Frankie had suggested that for those people creating movies, um, which I guess is happening more these days, and we do have a file size limit and don't take movies right now, you, if the movie's located in a directory where it's not gonna move, you could put a hyperlink, a document with a hyperlink to the movie if you felt like that was stable. and would, Because um, the idea is that a regional or national person can quickly scroll through here, see where there's paperclip icons, open those up and grab some stuff for a success story or something anytime they wanted to. Any other questions? We got about four minutes left. All right. The plant sector um, is pretty good. Okay, Andrew, Kim, Josh, anything you guys? want to add. I mean, this is the first field season, I guess I will say. Um, 
we expect there to be feedback. Uh, we like to hear the feedback. I don't know how quickly it will be implemented, but um, you know those mechanisms. Kim said there's been three or four things that are clearly um, desired by nearly all the users, um, and it helps us to hear those because then we can just demonstrate. You know, we heard this 30 times. It's clearly a desire. Um, so it is good to hear that feedback um, so that we can make changes for the next field season. And we, yeah, we will want to pass that information on to the steering committee and such too. So um, a couple yep. things I've got. One, I encourage you all to use the help system and tell other people about it. Um, Josh did an amazing job getting that thing populated and it's pretty thorough. Um, so definitely take a look in there if you have a question. We'd also like feedback on the help system too. So if you look in the help system and you don't find what you're looking for, or if you find something that's confusing, please let us know about that as well, because we'd like to fix that or add new stuff or, or whatever. Or if you think it's great, tell us that also so we can um, we know we're on the right track. Um, there's that, There's like I said, there is a user forum. Um, I think we're gonna try to build an FTEM specific um, forum just for FTEM. Um, that'll, we'll let you know when that's up and running. And then um, I guess the last thing I was gonna say is I don't, I know Dave Mueller's on from the steering committee. I don't know if he had any comments or anything he wanted to share with the group, Dave, or just status of things or whatever. You know, so from a national perspective, at least, you know, BLM for BLM people first, uh, you know, attachments are wonderful things. I uh, I use pictures and I use uh, attachments to, uh, you know, on my end for congressionals and reports to the fire directors, et cetera. So, um, Please, yeah, I know it's a lot of, it can be a little bit more work, especially when you have, you know, possibly over 200 intersections, uh, but uh, please attach things. Um, yeah, I think, you know, thanks for, thanks for putting this on, um, Carolyn and, and Kim. I mean, I even learned a few new things as, as well, and I appreciate that. Um, and yeah, please, please feedback. Uh, you know, the steering committee is really open to wanting this uh, this to work work well, and, and especially make it easy for the field. Uh, you know, it's got to be user friendly, and whatever we can do to to help uh, make it user friendly, please. Um, that's everybody on the steering committees view is we, we need to make this as user friendly as possible. We need that feedback. So that's about it. Great. Thanks, Dave. Um, well, thank you, Dana, for setting this up um, and anticipating the timing. I think it is good. Um, we've got it recorded um, and, and keep sending the feedback and questions. And if there are questions that are just preventing you from proceeding with your work or stumping them, just get them in there. We're usually pretty quick to respond. So happy to happy to help you guys get your work done. Awesome. Thanks so much again, Caroline and Kim and yeah. everybody for that. You guys bet. And I think what we'll do with the recording, we'll uh, we'll probably keep this one up on the webinar list as a general uh, recording with an emphasis on the batch monitoring. So we'll get that posted and let you guys know when it's up and available to share with others. Excellent. Thanks, Kim. All right. Everybody have a great day. Only if you do. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. You have a good day.